Our first speaker is Mark Gagan. Uh, Mark is with the University of Auckland and the School of the Environment. He's a professor there. Um, he's uh, gone through quite a career of many different things, and you can find that on the website. Uh, most of us probably know him uh, in this country best when he was at Penn State, uh, where he, he did uh, quite a bit of work associated with funded research, and you can find that on his website as well. Uh, also, many of us know him uh, as uh, one of the editors in uh, 2003-04 time frame of uh, International Journal of GI Science. Well, uh, Mark has a research interest and teaches courses in things like geovisualization, remote sensing, geocomputation, spatial data, structure, uh, uh, data structures, algorithms, uh, uh, the technical side uh, of GIS. Uh, with that, I'll let Mark uh, talk to you. Can you hear me OK? Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation to come here and talk. It's always a pleasure to be back in the USA. Really? No, I, I like it. Uh, back in the USSR, yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, um, my background is, uh, as Lynn said, is in GI science, but it's also in cyber infrastructure. When I was in the USA, I worked quite a lot with different communities other than GI science in cyber infrastructure. And since I moved to New Zealand, I've been working mostly in that area. So I direct a center for e-research at the University for Auckland, which is the New Zealand way of saying cyber infrastructure. But it's for all science, not just GI science. And the comments I'm going to make today mostly come from the experience I've had working with other research communities to try and develop cyber infrastructures for them. I thought we'd start with a state-of-the-art photograph. Um, the computer geeks among you will know that as the Mark I computer from Harvard in 1947. Not quite state-of-the-art today. But I'm going to be talking today about some of the qualities and responsibilities that come with a, a geographical cyber infrastructure. I think I'm going to talk about three things, if I get the time. Uh, basically, just as by way of an introduction, data-intensive GI science from data poor to data drowning in 40 years or thereabouts. And from then on to the challenges of organizing big data for GI science. What does that mean? And what might it look like in the future? What can we learn from looking at other disciplines who face this challenge before us? And thirdly, because we're at uh, NCSA, uh, looking at the challenges of computing with big data for GI science and um, what we might expect to see required in order for us to make the step, take the step away from relying on the desktop capabilities to relying on computing that we can outsource somewhere in the cloud or the supercomputer center, whichever is most appropriate. Just by way of an introduction then, and mostly for fun, um, data poor to drowning. And I'm going to look at just the restricted case of remote sensing. Obviously, if you wanted to cover the whole of GI science, you'd have to add in a lot more data than this. Uh, that's the new proposed Landsat sensor there. Not in orbit yet. Early remote sensing platforms looked like this. <laughs> this is a picture, actually, of the Bavarian, Bavarian Pigeon Corps, actually from a whole century ago. So it's more than 40 years. This is 100 years ago. These platforms were quite unstable. Um, the spectral and temporal resolutions were, were very poor. It was a panchromatic. Uh, photograph that was captured and unfortunately during conflicts they tended to be shot down by enemy soldiers not so much because they um, they wanted to stop the intel but because they were hungry uh, in the 70s and the 80s we saw the onset of the Landsat platform in the USA at least this is an, uh, a Landsat TM image from the 1930s Sorry, 1980s. Um, 30 meter by 30 meter pixels. Obviously, I'm missing out a lot on the, on the early pictures of, of, uh, from airplanes of remote sensing. Don't have time. Up to something more contemporary from the 2000s, a picture of Hong Kong Harbor at 2.5 meter resolution. Massive amount of detail. Fantastic to work with. To the days of Google Earth, where much data, apart from the stuff they take from cars, which we won't talk about today, um, comes from platforms like this, where you basically load a bunch of cameras in the back. You can maybe see where the cameras go just here. 
and you can have whatever cameras you like really and you can fly at fairly low altitudes and get images of more or less anything. The latest version of this, uh, I don't know whether you can see the writing on the side of the helicopter but it says we control in a kind of scary, scary letters. But a platform like this, um, those of us who aren't PhD students could actually even buy for ourselves. Um, you can fit whatever remote sensing equipment you like, fly it wherever you want to, uh, if um, the transport authorities are willing, and capture whatever imagery you like. Um, this is the future of, of, of remote sensing on a micro level. Massive amounts of data. How much data so far? Is, the, is perhaps the question we should be asking. Well, according to NASA and their EOS uh, program, they've got about 4.2 petabytes so far in 2010. That's just satellite data, Earth observation satellite data. The, the current unit of specifying how much data you have in a cyber infrastructure is, is based on the, the Library of Congress and how much storage it takes to digitize to store all the digital text. I don't know why, but it's become popular. So in terms of the digital text in the Library of Congress, the biggest library on the planet, this is 430 times more data that we've produced in just 30 or 40 years. But it's actually also three times smaller than the output from the Large Hadron Collider in just a single year. So you can see that it's a lot if you're used to thinking about libraries, but not very much if you're used to thinking about high energy physics. But of course also, that wasn't all of it. That was just the US EOS program. There'll be similar collections coming on stream uh, throughout the world, big collections in Europe and Asia already. And this is not photos or some of that more emergent data from low altitude, uh, the helicopters that you can buy yourself. It doesn't cover volunteer data. It doesn't cover map data or field data. And it doesn't cover what people call the long tail of dark data which doesn't necessarily mean uh, data captured by three-letter agencies. It also means all the data that's captured that never makes it into the public domain. It never becomes amenable to researchers. And people have estimated that the data in here is probably way bigger than 4.2 petabytes. So there's a lot. That's what we can conclude moving forward. How does it compare to other disciplines? Well, I mentioned the Large Hadron Collider, 10 to 14 uh, I think that should be petabytes, not yes, petabytes per year, sorry about that. Um, that's a 20 kilometer high stack of DVDs or 400,000 PC discs if you want to put it in perspective. So at the moment we're looking at uh, maybe uh, needing about that much ourselves if we were to store all the data that we have about the Earth. That's just a guess, an educated guess. If you look at biology and particularly genomics, they are the fastest producers of data right now. The volumes of data they have to store double every six months. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine whatever storage you have right now, you have to double it every six months? Imagine asking your dean or your head of department for twice as much storage as you had last year. Well, four times as much. Twice as much storage as you have now every six months. That's a lot. And um, so much that you can't actually back it up to tape as fast as you generate it. So much, in fact, that many, uh, many bioinformaticians now resort to storing their data in a fridge because it's easier to store the sample than it is to store the processed data. And yet, it, it, the samples are quite expensive to, to analyze. So that's where those disciplines are. There's a bottleneck in here caused by the fact that Moore's law has not kept up in terms of storage. And if you're going to run your storage as disk, and most people do, then you can't keep up with current technologies, nor with pricing either. So there's a bottleneck coming for GI science that perhaps we haven't seen yet, that we really need to be aware of, because it's going to hit us sometimes in the, in the next couple of years when we start running out of disk. What challenges for a GI science data infrastructure ar arise from all of that? Well, of course, how do we store all of that un unprecedented volume of data. The cost differential is increasing. As I said, the rate of data production is increasing. The degree that this is a problem for us is getting larger all the time. 
So that's the first problem, how do we store it? The second is how do we describe what we have? And we have to think here about describing what we have so that people can use it in the future. Perhaps people who we didn't think might use our data. There's a, a, a huge history of data reuse in geography and the earth sciences. And a lot of that has been unexpected to cope with unexpected challenges of the future, like carbon sequestration. People didn't think like that 30 or 40 years ago. Invasive species weren't looked at in the same degree of detail. But we have to be able to do that in the future and probably to make our data amenable to researchers who we can't anticipate might use it right now. What does that mean in terms of how we describe it? Never mind so that our colleagues now can find it. And that probably requires semantics and metadata and all kinds of complexities to help describe the data richly. If we can describe it richly, perhaps we can find it when we need it in the context of our current task. Most of the portals that we have right now are quite complex in terms of setting up the search. And there are many, many boxes you have to fill in in order to get to data that might be interesting to you. I tried a couple of them just outside now while I was preparing for my talk. And I, I, I reached fatigue when I was filling in my eighth or ninth box of parameters or, or keywords that I needed in order to make the search. The systems need to get smarter and understand what it is we're interested in, understand our context, and respond to that. Another challenge for us. And that becomes increasingly important when there are thousands and thousands, millions of data sets about an area on the Earth that we are interested in. That's typically our metaphor now for searching. Cut out a geographic region and find all the data sets within it. Well, when there are millions of data sets in that region, that doesn't help. The fourth question, one that we haven't had to deal with so much yet, but we, we have to face now, is working out what we can't keep because we can't afford to, because we don't have the infrastructure for it. So we have to work out what data gives us the most information gain, tells us the most that's new about the problems we're interested in, or even perhaps the ones we haven't thought of yet. A much harder problem. And finally, as a community, we're going to have to work out how to govern these data collections well, because we are custodians of them, and it's our responsibility to ensure that they are used properly and, and that reuse is promoted. That means effective governance structures that span these collections. So as an example of that, at the moment, uh, we tend to create um, markup languages and ontologies in very small communities and then impose them on the wider community saying, use these to mark up your data. Well, there's a lot of evidence to show that researchers don't like that in the wider community. They like to feel consulted and engaged. So how do we govern these massive collections so that people feel they own them? Uh, another really hard challenge. And I think there are some specific responsibilities around the spatial aspects too. The creation of those languages and tools to describe and find data are hard in the GI science and the earth sciences because of the complexity of the domain, because of the situated and interpretive nature of the data itself. All big challenges for us. But looking after the data isn't sufficient. We also have to provide the, the tools that allow these big data sets to be processed. And it's been great to hear the talks on this over the last couple of days. I was here yesterday, too. And some of the example work that's already underway. That's really important if we're going to have big data, that we can analyze big data. And that's a real challenge for us to be systematic about. I'll come to that later. Another aspect of that that I find myself doing in my job all the time is re-educating the expectations of researchers. And Mike mentioned this point yesterday briefly, too. Researchers out there cut their analysis, cut their research according to what they can do on their desktop. And this is particularly true in the GI sciences, where we have really well-established desktop tools. We have to reset that. And it's going to take a, a lot of effort to do so, to take the current generations of researchers and the new emerging generations of researchers and to point their gaze from their desktop GIS 
back into the cloud or at the supercomputing centers and say, this is where you can do your analysis now. Think big. Stop thinking about what you can do on the desktop. And a couple of more preachy ones that uh, you may agree with or disagree with, um, I think they're very important. What makes ge geoscience and GI science different from the other cyber infrastructures is that the, 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 the computational chemists, for example, or even the high energy physicists do experiments with data they artificially generate, typically. And so they could do that more or less at any time. There's no temporality to the data that they collect. Now, there are, there's temporality in the simulations that they make, but not to the data itself. So they aren't creating a living record of the evolution of, of, of atoms or subatomic particles. But we are. We're creating a living record of the planet. And we'll never get the chance to, to gather that information again. I think that this is more important than any of the work we do individually. And if that were true, then our main focus would be on preserving the data and making it reusable rather than analyzing the hell out of it ourselves. And it's interesting that we, we turn those two things around all the time, routinely, perhaps, perhaps for good reasons. But I'm suggesting that we need to think about turning them around again and thinking about the need of the community uh, as well, perhaps even before our own needs. We certainly don't think like that now. And until we are, we won't have really created a community around the data, because that's what a community around the data would do. There are some opportunities, too. Anyone tell me um, what these four different spatial analysis tasks have in common? I'll give you a clue. It's to do with the data gathering. We're all about data, but, but where might the data come from for all of those tasks? Same source. One of those. You can do all of those things from one of these now. Some of you will have some, seen that. Obviously, the, the traffic bottlenecks is easy. If your phone's on and you're in traffic, then the phone knows where you are. You can work out traffic densities by how fast you're moving. The earthquake epicenters is an interesting one, but all smartphones have an accelerometer in them. And you can, and it has been done, uh, figure out where earthquake epicenters and magnitudes are by using the accelerometers in these phones. You can track influenza epidemics, and that one's been reported quite a lot, by looking at uh, searches on Google for information about influenza. That tracks quite well uh, people turning up at emergency rooms and, and, and at their doctors for help with the symptoms. Land cover classification is a bit of a left field one, but one of the most accurate ways to classify land cover is by sound, and all of these have a microphone in them. If you can listen to the sounds around you, you can have a very good guess at what species might be there or what kind of an urban environment you're in. And again, there's some work on that already. Just to make the point that devices like this become quite rich uh, in terms of providing input for GI science, the so-called volunteered geographic information. We have only just seen the beginning of that, too. As those phones get smarter, uh, we will be able to answer more and more geographical problems by using them. And folks have um, talked about this a little bit before. Now, this is obviously a parody. Einstein never, ever said that. He would be horrified. Um, but there is this uh, paradigm, and a couple of people have mentioned it already, that's emerging, perhaps becoming stronger in, in science, that we can be data-led if we have enough data. We can let the data, we can let the theory emerge from the data. And um, uh, the examples I just showed you are somewhat along those lines. The fourth paradigm set, states that the data is the primary object and not necessarily the theory. The theory might come second. But, and it's a big but, as Stan Openshaw might say, all of this presupposes that we can anal analyze all this data that we have. And there are some high performance computing analysis challenges that we've been hearing about today. And I've tried to synthesize some of the things that I've heard uh, with some of the things that I've learned. 
The problem for us is to re-express all the algorithms that we have so that they scale across HPC hardware and, I would add, big data too. Now, Luke mentioned the importance of this also this morning. Depending on, on how you think about geographical information, you might think about slicing and dicing that problem in different ways. So you could th think in terms of map algebra, or you could think in terms of spatial objects and spatial processes and their unique properties and how they are organized computationally. But for all of the algorithms that we have, not just one or two that we might be interested in, all of them, we have to do a comprehensive analysis of how they scale if they scale, if they need scaling at all. So the challenge for us is to be systematic and not piecemeal. How do we do that? Well, the first question is to find out what limits those tasks. Now, many of them will have many limiting factors. Some will have just one, bottlenecks, if you like. Memory is an obvious bottleneck on most desktop applications, <laughs> which run out of clout somewhere between one and four or eight terabytes, usually. Gigabytes, sorry. I'm getting my units confused today. It's probably jet lag does that to you. But on a modest compute node now, a single node that you can put in a high-performance computer, you can get a terabyte of RAM. You can get two to eight terabytes on certain kinds of nodes. No reason why you couldn't scale your analysis up a thousandfold if memory was your limiting factor. Or what if it was CPU? Is it tightly bound, or is it embarrassingly parallel? Is it somewhere in between? There are architectures and methods that, that solve problems limited in those ways. We need to figure out how to map our algorithms to them. Are we data limited? Is the data access random, linear, blocky? What's the degree of locality of reference? How do you optimize the file store? Is replication the answer, like Google, Hadoop, Cassandra? Do they give you the tools that you need? Are your communications limited? It's the bandwidth of interconnect between the processors, moving data and instructions around. Is that a limiting factor? Or is it nothing? Are there no limiting factors for the particular algorithms you are working on? All of that we need to understand in more detail. Um, this is called domain decomposition, and it's the big problem that faces all of the sciences when you try to move them to high-performance computing. How do you break them up? Here's an example that I might show you later if I get the time to run a couple of minutes of video. It shows uh, uh, domain decomposition on an earthquake simulation, Southern California. Domain decomposition, what do we know about it? Well, there are uh, different technologies that we can use depending on the kinds of compute infrastructure we're using. And I won't go into the details here, but they have different affordances and they allow different kinds of scaling and different costs too. And all of this is known. In order for us to meet the high performance computing and supercomputing researchers halfway, we're going to get, we're going to need to be familiar with some of this and, and help do a translation for them. To put it another way, how do GI science algorithms map onto the well understood supercomputing templates? Are they dense grids, sparse grids? Are they computational fluid dynamics? Are they n-body interactions or Monte Carlo simulations? Are they data intensive? The templates for these are well understood. And I think that, in fact, most, if not all, of our GR science could be re-expressed using these primitive types in order for us to make use of what uh, the folks here already know. An interesting side question would be, are or are all our algorithms really covered? by all those templates, or do we fall somewhere in between? That would be an interesting discovery too. I haven't heard anyone mention that, but uh, it would be great to find out that in fact there was a unique use case that's specific to the earth sciences. I don't think so, but it'd be really cool if someone could find one. <coughs> Here's a picture of what that might involve, because we can't obviously re-engineer every algorithm uh, in finite time. Even with a five-year project, that becomes too much. So think about it in terms of the cost of re-engineering an algorithm against the cost of the slowdown that you have to put up with. And also think about the utility of those various algorithms. Don't do uh, a speed up of something no one else will ever use. Think of what's most important in the community and go there first. So you're looking for the red dots. 
that provide a biggest slowdown, which are easiest to re-engineer. Finally, in order to make a GIS um, popular, used in a community, sorry, uh, any cyber infrastructure within any cyber community, it needs to become sticky. It needs to attract people back again. It needs to form a community. So the question is, how do you attract and keep that community involved? Obviously, there's outreach and engagement, and this is an example of that, so that's a good start. But you also need compelling and appealing functionality, which might involve data and methods repositories that are actually useful enough that people keep coming back to the portal to get more. Workflows that make it easy to use that stuff and to repeat the science, leading to better repeatability, better communicating of the science. Semantic interoperability that helps all the, use, all the data and all the methods integrate uh, more effectively for researchers. We don't want to be worried about whether our categories are the same as someone else's categories. We just want to merge them and make a map of land cover change. We have to incentivize those contributions. And we have to think about continuity. No one is going to join a cyber infrastructure where the clock is ticking and the money runs out in three years' time. There has to be a deeper engagement at the academy level to make these things sustainable, and sustainable early so that people come and invest in them. No one's going to invest in something that runs out of money in a year. So here is a great um, portal for getting data. It's the Data One portal by the Data One group being built here by Bill Michener and his team. It's what you might use to get data. It still doesn't understand my context but at least it can give me a map of New Zealand and I can go and find my data. Workflows. Um, here's an example of a computational workflow in a language called Taverna, popular with bioinformaticians. It's also situated in a, a social media tool, in, my ex, in a tool called My Experiment. So there's a workflow in there that you can actually execute. And there are comments and friends of the workflow in the surrounding tabs. So you can be friends of this workflow too and invite your friends to look at your latest work with this workflow. So you get the social interaction and the science and the uh, repeatability of the science all at once. Semantic translation, here's a portal called SEMDAT that my team have been working in, which seamlessly translates categories on maps so you don't have to worry about them if you're a user. And we need a killer app. Something that people go, wow, that's amazing. I wish we had one of those. Um, in, the geo, in the geosciences, the killer app, which is, seems to have gone. Ah, the killer app has disappeared. That's kind of sad. Oh, it really has. I probably don't have time anyway. I'll show it you afterwards if you're interested. It's um, a simulation of... Um, Simulation of earthquakes in Southern California. So to conclude. Oh, there we go. Okay. Big data creates new ways of approaching GI science that can be discovery led rather than theory led. We need to scale up our storage to take advantage of this. And we need to find ways to make useful data reusable, findable, understandable by ourselves and future generations. We also need to scale up our methods in GI science so we can analyze these data. Domain decomposition has always been the challenge for GI science. It's been a challenge for 30 years or more. It still is. We need a systematic analysis of the algorithms we use and their bottlenecks and their amenability to parallelization so that we can make progress. Such an analysis is an ongoing task because high performance computing opportunities and models change too. We can't do this once and then be done. We have to keep redoing it. And we have to re-educate because expectations are down here right now. What we could do with this infrastructure is up here. Finally, we can use the best tools and technologies from other disciplines. We don't have to build it ourselves. 
there is some fantastic work on semantics, on workflows, on simulations that have been done in other communities that perhaps have been in this game longer than we have. We really need to look at those communities and think what we can get from them cheaply uh, to reuse rather than reinvent. I know there's a tendency to think that we have to be able to write papers about it, so therefore we have to do it in a new way. I don't think that's the most effective way to make a working infrastructure. So thanks very much for your attention. Happy to take questions if there's time. Don't be shy. I have a question. So one of the points that you made was about uh, the uh, stickiness and the sustainability of cyber infrastructure. Yep. When I look at, at GIS, uh, one of the things that it seems to me is, is its inception was in a lot of different academic circles, and then there was a, the capacity in both academic and, and private sector to make instances of GISs that were adopted and have since evolved over time. Uh, is cyber infrastructure a, uh, able to operate under that model, or are the requirements of cyber infrastructure so large that, that that model just won't work and we have to look towards some other approach? Okay, I'm, I'm not quite sure I understood the comparison you were making earlier. Was it about the fact that we can now assemble a GIS that we want from components Would GIS still there? be here and have been sustained if there wasn't a marketplace and ah, people right. were able to sell GIS? Uh, yeah. Cyber infrastructure is a lot bigger than that. Right. And is it sustainable? Well, I think it is. And there are cyber infrastructures out there that have been well sustained over 10 years or more, which I suppose in the scheme of things is quite a long time, um, but not as long as GIS. But equally, there are also cyber infrastructures that have failed and um, attracted very few users and no recurrent funding and, and died. So I guess what I was trying to point to are some of the winning formulas that I've seen in order to maybe make this thing sustain. But I do think it won't work unless we manage to move researchers to it, which is an active task, not a passive one. So I think it's up to us to show the value of it and to encourage people to move to it. That, just like in GIS, you need marketing. It won't happen uh, of itself. Other questions? Maybe there's a final question. Uh, you said that we need to uh, re-educate uh, researchers, essentially, to uh, the, their expectations mm -hmm. uh, with respect to GIS because of the capability of big data in, in our cyber infrastructure now or where it's going. Don't you think that's already happening with things like uh, uh, Google Earth and uh, those types of things, opening people's eyes to some possibilities they didn't see before? That's right. Google Earth collects, connects researchers, anybody, with massive amounts of data, truly mind-boggling amounts of data. And it does that in a seamless, simple way from, from your web browser. So in that sense, yes. But I certainly see, every day I see researchers, young and old, who have made their problem this big because that's how much will run on their computer. And I think most of the GIS software that we have is this, is this big in terms of what you can do with it. Whereas we can be thinking much bigger than that in terms of the kinds of analyses, the kinds of spatial and temporal resolutions, the kinds of simulations and uncertainty uh, simulations that we can run, that, run now to get far better results. So it's on the analytical side that I think we need to raise people's sights. Thank you. Oh, that prompted some questions. We'll get Don first. Oh, thank you. Uh, it was a great presentation, Mark, and, and this uh, discussion that you're having right now about us being uh, often limited, uh, limiting the sizes of our problems because of the desktop, I think is also limiting us in terms of 
uh, how willing we are to work with other researchers. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea of geographers working with computer scientists or climate modelers working with social scientists, uh, if we are willing to expand our horizons, so to speak, as you are encouraging us to do by thinking big and in the cloud, that also means that we are expanding our uh, collaboration networks, which I think is one of the great things that this project seems to be bringing forth. So I just wanted to make that comment. No, I think you're right. And I think a, a good cyber infrastructure would integrate with other cyber infrastructures and encourage us to be working more comprehensively with the folks who do landscape genetics, for example, or, or helping us to understand the impacts of earthquakes on residential zones. All of those are problems that we could add to uh, that might have already ha that might already have a physical solution that we can add the social component to. So integrating between the cyber infrastructures would be a, a great challenge too to help to help facilitate that. Yeah, uh, I think the, you mentioned about the first paradigm of the science is a big data lead to the scientific discovery and innovation. But also we need to think about the quality of data. I think that right now the social media, a lot of uh, collection data has lots of error, lots of noise. Right. How can we improve the quality and how can we reduce the noise? I think that's a very challenging. Do you have any suggestion for our community? I. I'm not sure that it's practical to reduce the noise in all situations. Mike mentioned this too in his talk this morning. There's, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a consequence of social media that there will be noise. And sometimes it, it may even outweigh the signal. But the noise has fairly predictable characteristics too, and the signal nonetheless emerges. When you're dealing with millions of data points, you can afford to have very, very noisy data. Now that may not be true using traditional statistics or less true, but using machine learning methods, it's not so much of a problem. Now I guess that over time, the, the, the noise of con in contributed uh, or volunteered data may drop. We may get better at, at figuring out where people are when they're using their phone. Um, but equally, people will get cleverer at, at misleading us as to where they are when they're using their phone. So I think we'll just have to learn to deal with that. Thanks, Mark. Uh, let's move on to the next one. We'll have some time for the, pan the panel afterwards. Hand for Mark. 